Today, we're going to take a look at the high grade Zaku Desert type double antenna type. The kit is P Bandai, first as a July 2021 pre order, although it has made at least one other appearance on the P Bandai website afterwards. This isn't the first desert type Zaku Bandai has put out. The standard MOS 6D was released in May 2020, but I'm glad this version exists as I like this design more than the original. The kit has a remarkable amount of different shades of tans and browns molded as well as the grey for all of the frame parts compared to the usual three colors for most Gundam the Origin Zakus. And there's also some black for the backpack. There are no color correction stickers in this kit, which is something I can't really say for other kits I've seen. The desert type Zaku is also pretty different from the other Zakus out there. Most of these Origin kits share 70% of their parts with each other, but since this Zaku has a boxier look, there's quite a bit that's new. It has a different head, backpack, shoulder shield, spiked shoulder armor, legs, frame parts for the legs, skirt armor, and even different forearms. It also has a different version of the Zaku machine gun and some desert type specific armaments. I think the only common parts between this kit and the standard origin Zaku are the hands, feet, some of the frame parts, and the polycaps. But what made me get this kit were these. These are water slide decals for the camouflage striping, and I'm sure that was the main point of interest for this kit, and it's why I bought two. That way I could build one on the box and do a custom paint job on the other. Because this kit has so many new parts, the build was a bit refreshing from what I'm used to, but still went together very quickly as a high grade Zaku should. As stated earlier, the desert type Zaku has a boxier look, and it's something I wasn't really a fan of at first. But these design elements allow this kit to avoid some of the flaws the Origin Zakus have. Because there are flatter surfaces, it makes getting rid of seam lines much easier. On Zakus, the part that really sticks out with this issue is the spiked shoulder armor, which typically is very curved. The Sen release Origin Zaku also has one of the spikes molded in two halves with the armor itself, but on this kit that middle spike is a separate piece, which negates the issue entirely. Another issue this kit solves is with the leg armor. Standard origin Zakus have the lower leg pieces molded in two parts so you have a seam line visible. On this kit, the lower legs are made up of four pieces so all of the seam lines are hidden. But possibly my favorite part of this kit is the mono eye. Some of the older HDUC Zakus have raised detail for the mono eye, which makes things simple if you want to paint it yourself by not using the kit stickers. On the origin line, this detail was removed, so you either have to use the kit stickers or add a mono eye yourself. This kit, however, has a mono eye and the style of the RG and MG Zakus with a gear bit that turns the mono eye as you turn the head. Bandai didn't need to include this part, especially since they haven't done it before in the origin lineup, but it's a great touch. After building the kit, but before applying the decals, I sprayed a light coat of semi-gloss. I wasn't sure how the decals would take to the bare plastic, so I just did what I normally do. Bandai's water slides have a thicker carrier film than the third party decals I normally use, so I wanted to avoid silvering and a coat of semi-gloss gives an even surface, which prevents that from happening. Bandai decals are very thick, contain a lot of adhesive, and dry very slowly, which I normally don't like. The decals were so thick I was actually able to maneuver them in place with my hobby knife without worrying. But for this application, these properties actually worked out, since you have to match up so many decals with each other. That being said, it wasn't all perfect. These decals not only have a thick carrier film, the carrier film extends a bit past the decal which makes it difficult to line things up, especially on edges. Carrier film is the clear bit that holds the decal together and is the main obstacle in the way of making decals look painted on. I found myself wanting to slice off the excess carrier film while the decals were drying, but I used a large amount of decal softener and I didn't want a slip of the knife to tear things in ways I couldn't repair. The instructions for applying the decals weren't really clear either. So I didn't use all of them, just because in some parts I had no real idea of what was going on. P Bandai instructions don't normally have color, which would have really helped with decal placement since it is such a big part of this kit. 
The decals also have to conform to a lot of different surfaces, so mine ended up wrinkling in some places, most notably on the legs, which do have a lot of like extra detail. I found myself wondering how the product images looked so perfect because mine didn't look anything like that. After letting things dry, I started chipping up the decals. I first brushed the decals with a few coats of decal softener just because they are so thick. I only used a hobby knife for chipping because I wanted to chip the details and I thought that if I used tweezers, I would just push the decals around. I focused most of the chipping on the edges of decals, but I also worked in lots of scratches and chips on the center of things. Because this is a desert Zaku and the kit is molded in multiple shades of tan, I thought using sandy effects wouldn't be that visible, so instead I wanted to use the chipping as a point of interest. While chipping these decals I noticed something interesting. If I had a chip that was too big or a shape that I didn't like, I could correct it by using decal softener to melt the chipped off piece in place and get a result I liked. This allowed me to also get some much needed texture, as well as a bit of a fail safe if I felt things were out of hand. If I used this much decal softener on my thinner decals, I would have just destroyed them, but in this very specific case, Bandai's water slides are superior. After I was satisfied with how things turned out, I let things dry overnight and I sprayed everything with just another light coat of semi gloss just to protect everything. I then did a pin wash using black acrylic, and this is something I got really lucky with. When I normally do a wash, there's always a little bit of cleanup involved, but on this kit, it went as perfectly as I could get it, having to just touch my brush to a panel line and the wash would flow through. The only reason I can think of this is that the kit is unpainted and that the plastic is a much smoother surface than a painted one, but that is honestly my best guess. I wanted to tone everything down and blend everything together, so for that I'm applying a tan filter. Filter is a heavily thin paint applied all over the surface of your model, and does the same thing a filter in photography does. On something that's only one color, you can use it to slightly tint your base coat, but for something in multiple colors like this Saku, it will subtly blend everything together. This is really needed on parts like the white caution markings, and after the filter, they do become a lot less stark. My filter wasn't as thin as it probably should be, although the consistency of a filter is probably a debated topic. That being said, since I used a sand color for it, any part where it dried a bit too heavy also worked as sandy effects to fit the desert environment. And the brush motions I'm applying this filter with are vertical, just because if it does dry a bit too heavy, it also creates some subtle streaked effects. Now I'm doing some actual painting. I tried to use as little paint as possible on this build, but I felt that the weapons needed that little touch. For my Zaka machine guns, I always paint the drum magazines in a shade of green. I like how it's different from the gray, and it ties all my different Zakus together. Normally I use a green gray, but I wanted something a little different, so I used a paint that was a deeper green. And of course, I painted the blade of the Heat Hawk to give it a fiery sort of appearance, as well as the cracker grenades in a shade of red, just to give them a little pop of color. I'm extending the chipping from the secondary colors, i.e. the decals, to the model surface itself, which means metallic effects. Normally, I use metallic undercoats, and I physically chip the paint, but there isn't any paint to chip. As a result, I'm doing sponge chipping with a metallic paint. Sponge chipping is one of those techniques you mostly associate with beginners in weathering, but it works so well that I'm using it here. 
It's random, but if you apply it carefully, you can control it to some extent. It's also a great starting technique since you can use it for general chipping and further refine the shapes of your chipping with fine brushwork. Randomness is the most important part of chipping, and I think there isn't really a comparison if you're painting on your chipping effects. After this, I'll give the model a final coat of clear, but this time with a flat spray instead of a semi-gloss one. The flat coat is really where the magic happens in my opinion, and is what makes a bare plastic model look painted even if you didn't do any sort of weathering like I did. Now that the model has a nice even flat coat, I'm going to break it up with some gloss speckling. Speckling is very messy and you can get paint specks in places you don't necessarily need or want if you don't protect your work surface. With speckling, some visual texture is being added and much in the way a filter does, speckling will also tie multiple colors on a model together. It's always nice to have some sort of glossy effect, and speckling is a very subtle way of doing so, although you can definitely make it heavier depending on preference. And preference is something important to keep in mind. Even though I mainly focus on creating weathering that's more on the realistic side, what I do and how I do it comes down to my preferences. Even if we try to chase realism, it's still our own interpretation. And after the speckling, our model is done. These videos aren't really meant to be a tutorial on what you're supposed to do with Gunpla, but rather an insight on how I do things. And if you like what you see, feel free to use these techniques. Thank you for watching, and I'll be seeing you in the next video, whenever that is.